All right, everyone. Uh, welcome. Sorry for the little delay. We had some technical issues. Uh, we're going to get started. We're going to show a little video and uh, we will take this away. So. Hello, everyone, and welcome to today's session. We are Pre-Med CC, a student-led organization established in the fall of 2021. Our goal as an organization was to create an online community for pre-medical students at community colleges and universities with the hope of guiding the next generation of diverse and inclusive physicians. And while we advertise our organization as being for community college students, our events are open to anyone. We realize that finding guidance and mentorship in a pre-med journey can be especially challenging for first-generation pre-med students, people that lack the financial resources, or just those that do not know people in the medical field. One of the best parts about our events is that they are virtual, so you can do it from the comfort of your own home. We typically have events on Fridays from 5 p.m. to 6 p.m. PST, and on Saturdays from 10 a.m. to 11.30 a.m. PST. If you aren't able to attend the event, all our sessions are uploaded on our YouTube channel. Many of our sessions will end with Q&A with our speakers. Any questions that you have can be put in the Q&A section on Zoom, and our team members will read them and have them answered. After you have attended our event, you can log on to our website and complete the quiz, which will contain questions pertaining to our session today. If you score 70% or higher on the quiz, you'll be awarded a two-hour mentorship certificate to show that you attended our session today. If you want to stay connected with our upcoming events or want to tell your pre-med friends about pre-med CC, you can find us on Facebook, YouTube, Instagram, and TikTok at Pre-Med CC. Welcome everyone. I will be introducing a wonderful guest speaker. So Dr. Cristobal Barrios is a board certified general surgeon with added qualifications in surgical care. He is a health science clinical professor of surgery at the UC Irvine School of Medicine and is a practicing trauma and general surgeon. Dr. Barrios completely completed his training in surgical critical care here at UCI in June of 2007 and subsequently joined UCI in July of the same year. Dr. Dr. Barrios is a director of the Trauma Division Research Program, director of the Critical Care Core Lecture Series, serves as a chair of the UCI School of Medicine Admissions Committee, and is chair of the or Organ Donor Council. Dr. Barrios' clinical research in trauma and critical care Issues include the utility of thoracic CT imaging um, in trauma patients, anemia, traumatic brain surgery, end of life issues, organ donation among minorities, geriatrics and alcohol and drug use among trauma patients. His work has been presented at numerous professional conferences and has been published in a number of peer reviewed journals. Dr. Barrios is also a passionate humanitarian volunteer. Since 2011, he has participated in nine mission trips to date in Nicaragua, Peru, El Salvador and Colombia through the International Medical Alliance Organization. Wow, I get to sleep too. Um, hi there, everybody, um, all 65 of you. Um, I really don't do a formal lecture. I am very stream of consciousness, um, and but I will somehow cover some of these topics that I get a lot of questions uh, about. Um, and so um, we can do it that way. Um, oh my God, are people still freaking out? I just got something in the chat. Um, um, anyways, so why don't we do this? Because this will help answer a lot of questions is, is what do we look for or what does it take um, for an applicant to be accepted? And I can really kind of sort of, I can't give you specific numbers. I can give you ranges. I can give you ideas. I can't be held fast to anything because if I say, oh, this certain grade will get you in um, and it's not true, then you could be upset with me and the university and so, but, but I can give you ideas, right? And, and, and we could talk a little bit about diversity as well um, because uh, it's a little bit of what we deal with um, to, to ensure that, um, the class represents the community, which is really the ultimately the goal um, of a lot of programs um, when it comes to diversity. So what do we look for? 
Well, obviously there's a magic GPA and there's a magic MCAT combination that you just have to be above. And I, I, I really can't tell you the numbers I can for how low we will go, because again, it's a mathematical formula, but I can tell you that the average at UCI is somewhere between 3.6 and 3.7 for a GPA. So that means there's people below and there's people above. Um, and our average uh, MCAT is somewhere in the, the lower teens. Um, and again, that means there's a lot of people above, you know, some people who get a 527 and there's people who get a 50 something. Um, but after the mathematical formula, um, what happens? And so we look at three big broad categories. We look at research, we look at community service, and we look at clinical exposure. Research, kind of a plus minus because if you do zero research, there are still some kids that get into UCI without doing re research, but, and there's some programs around the country, some medical schools that, that don't care. Um, however, most will want to see some sort of research. Most undergrads tend to do basic science research. I am not a big fan personally, and I have a whole nother lecture that I could talk about for an hour about what kind of research you can do and when, what kinds of research there are. Um, but the three broad, broad categories of that are basic science, um, retrospective outcomes type research and clinical research where you're, you're dealing with, you know, how does drug A versus drug B work on a patient? How does procedure one versus procedure two work on a patient? And both when you're in med school, it's a whole different story. When you're undergrad, most people do um, basic science research because it's, you can incorporate that from classes that you take or, or you have some interest, but what, why do we look for that? Right. Because not only do we want you to start developing the skills of how to do research, um, but we also look at like, do you know if research is good? When, when can you recognize a good research article from a bad research article? Because not all research articles are, have the same amount of quality. And so not only are you advancing science when you're doing research, but you're learning whether the science that you're doing is good or whether there's somebody's trying to tell you, sell you some research that isn't good. Right. And, and, and so that's why if you come with that skill set, we, we kind of appreciate, um, uh, I'll get to some of these other questions I'm seeing now. Uh, well, since we're talking about research, um, does the publication matter if it's a case report or an actual article? Case reports are okay, but um, look for more. Um, I see case reports as kind of like the, at least you're showing interest, but uh, let me also get back to what we look for. We, rather than you doing like, oh, I did this research for one semester and I did another research for another semester. I really would rather see you do hours and hours with one specific person for an hour or two. Um, that's where most of your points are going to come from in the research category. Publications will get you more points, obviously. But more importantly, really more than anything else, also aside from the time spent, is did you get a letter from that person? Like if you really did a lot of research with one person and you say it was meaningful, then does that person corroborate your story, right? And so, you know, if this is the principal investigator or whoever's lab, try to get a letter from them. Um, and my personal favorite research is um, what I call the outcomes uh, research because that's data. The patients have come and gone somewhere on somebody's desk or in somebody's computer or in a hospital's medical record electronic medical record, that data is just sitting there and it's just waiting for you to ask a good question and pull it out. Um, you know, in, in disclosure, I'm actually sit on one of the IRBs, the Institutional Review Board that, you know, approves research at, at our institution. Um, and, and that's a relatively easy thing to get approved. And, and it's not, and you can do it at home. Once you get the data, you can work on it at one o'clock in the morning if you wanted to, or you could work on it on the weekends. And so that's not only my personal preference, but um, it also uh, 
works that that you know my students or my residents or whatever can do it whenever they can if you're committed to a lab you're committed to a lab and that's a physical time and space that you need to be there and the same thing with clinical research you have to be there waiting for patients to show up and and, and dealing with them so um they um that's also hard to come by, right? That's a time commitment, but as opposed to the outcomes when you can do it at your own convenience. Um, let me see. Oh, so we have another question here. Um, so yeah. how does the SCOTUS decision impacted admissions at UCI School of Medicine? Well, let me get to that later. Um, uh, remind me to come back around to that one. Um, and to be honest with you, for California schools, it really doesn't impact it all that much for a particular reason. But um, it, then the other activity that I'm talking about is, is clinical exposure and the community service, right? And the community service can be clinical or it can be non-clinical. And, and why do we look for that? And again, I'm talking, I'd rather see you do a couple or one long, big long-term project as opposed to a bunch of little smatterings for a month here and a month there. A, because it shows commitment. Uh, and it shows um, genuine interest as opposed to like, I know you're checking off boxes by trying to do a lot of different things. And two, I don't care what they say. Medicine is still a very sacrificed field. Um, and, and if you show that you're able to give of yourself, um, then that, that, that helps us gauge that. And then the last thing is, is actual clinical exposure. Right. And, and uh, the popular things right now are things like scribing, um, EMT work, and not just getting the certification, but actually doing the EMT work, uh, working as an MA or a nurse's assistant, or something where you're literally just rolling up your sleeves and and working. And, and why do we why do we do that? And again, same thing. I'd rather you do a lot of hours doing one thing than you know lots of short bursts of hours doing a lot of different things. So we look for commitments of like, did you do that for a year or more? Um, and, um, but why do we do that? Right. And this is what I tell people, right. We had 7,000 kids start applications this year, 4,000 of them committed to it. And most of those got through the screening process. And, and, and so how do I know that from the 4,000 people that did that, that they actually went out and tested that theory that they wanted to go to med school, right? Do they know what they're getting themselves into? And so I get a lot of feedback of like, oh, you're just making us go through the hoops and you know, all this stuff. And like, no, I'm not making you go through the hoops. I want to know that you can display a little bit of self-sacrifice, that you know what you're getting yourself into, that you want to advance medicine a little bit, and that you understand that, you know, some new thing coming down the pipeline is actually based on good science or not. And so that's why we ask for those things, not because we're just trying to figure out a way to keep people out or not being able to apply or not have them be competitive. Um so, and, and then there's a question here about specifically, like, what do you think are some of the best research opportunities? I, I tell people, you, know, you got to make a lot of phone calls. You got to make a lot of emails. You got to make a lot of door knocking, find people who are interested in the subject that you are interested. I can guarantee you there are a lot of attendings out there in whatever specialty that you want that are just waiting for somebody to go, Hey, I am willing to look at some stats for you and, and come up with the research idea and just give me some data and I'll, I'll help you with it. Um, and, and you're going to get a lot of no's, but it just takes one yes. And I can't be very specific. There are some portals out there and I don't really know what they are because I don't bother with them of, of uh, people that are publishing the kind of research that they're working on or the kind of research that they're interested in or projects that they might already have. I know that's available to the medical students um, and possibly to our undergrads, but um, your school, wherever you are, should have um, either a list of people or you just pick up the directory for whatever hospital and you just start making phone calls. And like I said, like you, you'll find somebody or start asking people that you already know who are in that field and they may know somebody. So it, it takes a little bit of sleuthing. Um, and And so it's not, you know, it's not completely from scratch because there, there should be some abilities to, um, you know, help you access who does what, but you may just have to do some sleuthing on your own. Um, and, and I wish I could offer you something more specific than that. 
uh, Back that, to Barrios. Yeah. So I kind of know your style a little bit, but people are asking public health research, clinical research, research All the assist same. that. All the, the same. Go, go, go find whatever it is that you're interested in. And in, in if whether that's psychiatry or physical therapy or nursing or like a lot of people are still going to look at whether you did research or not. And, and so go find the people in that field. Right. And like, I'm telling you from my perspective, because I have kids coming to me because I'm a surgeon, but you know, I, there's a nurse, you know, you see eye health now has a school of pharmacy, has a school of nursing, has a school of, of, you know, public health. Um, and, and so there's different opportunities for different fields within medicine for you to be able to do that. Um, if, if that helps a little bit, um, and you just, like I said, you just got to knock on some doors, um, and, and, and work your way from there. Um, I may be partnering for instance, with the pharmacy school on something that has to do with pain control for perioperative patients. And so I, I'm going to hit them up and find out who might be interested. I, even at my stage in the game, I'm still just literally making phone calls, uh, and asking around going like, Hey, this is kind of what I'm interested in. Do you know anybody or you yourself? Uh, and you know, I mean, I have a little bit of the, of, of privilege that, um, I'm coming out of it, at it from a higher level, but it's essentially the same style and the same, uh, approach of just hit people up until you find what you want or, or, and even ask them, well, if you don't, who do you know who does? Um, and, uh, anyways, I don't want to keep beating that one to death. Uh, is a post pack GPA concern? Yeah, let's now let's get to some random other questions. Um, since I gave you the gloss on what we kind of sort of look at, um, personal statements is a whole nother fun issue, um, that we can get into. Um, uh, oh, there was a good question there about being a research assistant that takes vitals. Don't double dip. If your research really is more clinical, then list it as clinical. If your research really is more basic science research or, or um, because clinical research is a gray zone for us, or if you want to divvy it in half, but don't try to say, well, I did 2000 hours this year uh, as you know, a clinical research assistant and then list it down in the clinical portion as well. I did the same 2000 hours from this time to this time, because we're going to notice that don't try to double dip um, or try to pick one more than the other. Um, and, uh, let's get to some of these other questions and now we can start freeforming and, and answering some questions. Right. Um, uh, let's see. So you got to keep plugging away. I know there says somebody said that they're not getting good quality research, especially clinical. We're not that picky about like what exactly the research was, as long as it was legitimate, maybe as long as you got a letter from that person saying that your work was honest and true and, and you were getting somewhere and you were good in the lab. Um, or if you're just doing the retrospective stuff like I do, I have undergrads and I have post banks that come to me and I do data-driven research where I give them a set of data and they work on it and, and they publish something. Um, so don't worry that it also has to be wet lab uh, or clinical lab. Try to find somebody who does retrospective work in the area that you're interested in, um, and 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 you can get there from that standpoint from the retrospective, data driven research. Um, let's see, uh, is a post back GPA considered separately than undergrad? Like you had difficulty in undergrad, but going like so again, um, that takes a little that's a little formula esque, right? We actually kind of do take into account, like some people struggle, right? When they first go to their first year and then their GPA gets better, but quote unquote, the damage is done. Um, and then they do a post back to kind of polish it even further. We take into consideration, was there an uptrend in your GPA? Uh, was there a good reason why maybe you tanked one of your semesters? Um, but yes, we do, we do, what is this? I don't even know what that is. Um, that um, your, your post back GPA was good, even though you ended up with a slightly lower GPA. Yes, that's taken into account. Um, 
uh, separately. So <clears throat> if you did really well, well on your post bat, that's going to help you because we do take that into consideration. But then again, I'm also saying that it was whether you had a rough start and got better or whether you had a really good reason why you had one bad semester. You know, if you're consistently low on stuff, I don't know if that's going to help you or not. And again, it depends on the GPA that you ended up with. Um, and by the way, and I get this a lot, if I sound like I'm being a little bit vague is because a, I am, well, I am being a little bit vague because like I said, I, I can't give you specific numbers, um, because it's one big giant consideration and one big giant formula. And if you have a slightly lower GPA and a really good MCAT, or if you had a bad first year, you know, and then, and then the rest got better. Uh, I mean, these are all things that we slightly take into consideration, um, and, and so the goalposts move a little bit, so I can't be specific. I can't see, because otherwise all I would say was like, well, if you don't get a 4.0 and a 99% on your MCAT, then it's over. But that's not true. I mean, like I said, I gave you a range of, of GPAs and MCATs, and there's a lot of people below and a lot of people above to get to that one median, you know, um, average. And so uh, don't feel like, oh my God, if I didn't get a 4.0, I'm never getting it. That's just, that's not true. There a lot more goes into that besides your MCAT and your GPA. Uh, you mentioned diversity, but I wanted to ask you, just what are your assumptions? There really isn't one. Most kids do the traditional stuff, some sort of um, science-based uh, uh, you know, degree. And that could be biology or chemistry or, or, and I can almost tell where some kids are coming from. Cause if they went to Berkeley, they probably got a molecular and cellular biology degree. If they went uh, to, I mean, you know, I could go off on a couple of the other ones, but um, those are just the traditional ones, but we do pick other people. We pick people who like didn't even do anything in medicine. We've picked, you know, literature, philosophy, um, you know, uh, what else is there? You know, things that aren't, hardcore sciences that's okay as long as you met the requirements for the courses that we do require and then you have to go to each school individually to see what courses they require you know what kind of biology what kind of chemistry ochem like physical chem all that all those you know each school has a slightly different formula of what they find acceptable um so you have to do your homework there but no you don't have to have an actual medical uh or, or an actual basic science degree for us to consider you seriously um, there's, you know, like I said, history, literature, um, and, and, and those are not as commonly picked, but that's just because also because of the odds, because like if 90% of my kids are applying that did biology and chemistry and physics and blah, then likely is the 90% of the kids that I'm going to pick are chemistry and biology. So you don't necessarily have to feel pigeonholed, um, to take a very specific block of, of medical basic science type of things in order to get yourself in and be considered, um, which is probably a frustrating answer for a lot of you, but um, it, that is what it is. Um, um, and then, well, I kind of already answered this one, uh, a GPA of 3.6 with an upward trend and, and is there a big factoring story in there? Yeah, and that's what your personal statement and your secondaries have something to do with like, you know, explain something, you know, UCI, one of the questions that they always ask is, um, you know, describe some adversity that you became. And if it's something that was an adversity, then, um, then by all means, put that in there to help, you know, tell what, what, um, what caused a perceived 3.6, but a 3.6 is kind of sort of in our average range. So it's not that bad. Uh, D1 athletics, a major factor. Um, yes and no again, right? If, if you, we do give a little wiggle room for hardcore kids. If you were four years D1, um, whatever sport it was, um, and maybe your clinical, your little, little clinical activities, a little on the lower side or your community services a little on the lower side, but we kind of almost consider, an athlete um, of that caliber doing a little bit of community service because um, it, it, it's part of the college experience. But again, if your GPA doesn't support it and you had zero research and you had zero clinical exposure, 
being a D1 isn't going to help you, right? Does it go into your formula? Yes. Um, but can you rely on that as a really good reason why you didn't do any clinical exposure or didn't do any community service? Probably not. Um, if that helps your answer there. Uh, I would also go as further as to say as a D1 athlete, you have a lot more opportunities for community service. Like um, I know that one of the hospitals I worked at, some of the athletes would come and visit the Pete's floor. Um, and yes, that's actually with them yeah. and stuff. So there's yeah. a lot of opportunities that you can do that as community service. And you have actually a bigger spotlight on you for that than, Yes, that is, that is correct. Dosh, and actually, yeah, I appreciate the fact that you said that because you will have more opportunities. People will want you to go to like, you know, go visit kids, uh, go visit a cancer camp, go visit like, you know, perform <laughs> some sort of activity of, of, you know, fundraising or something. So yeah, uh, use that, those opportunities aside from just being the athlete um, and take advantage of that. So that, that's actually a really good point. Um, let me see. Uh, in the meeting, you know, junior has already been done. How do you feel about listing future plans? You are correct that as an athlete, um, like we have somebody in our team who's a on our leadership team, she's actually the president of pre CC. She's a D1 basketball women's basketball player, and she has a hectic schedule, and, and you can do it. Um, it's just you have to schedule and be organized, yeah, time management, all that. Um, how do I feel about projected stuff? Um, I appreciate it, especially if you're projecting something that you've already started. I kind of don't take it completely or I take it with a grain of salt. If you promise me that you're going to start it, but you haven't really started it yet, um, then that's kind of like, oh, okay. And again, also, if you did zero before and you projected 2000, um, it's a little sus. Um, but if you say, Hey, listen, I already started, I've been into it for a month or so. And, but the rest of the hours are going to go into the time before I would actually start medical school. Uh, I'll take that into consideration that that's actually okay. Um, if your GPA ends up looking okay and you got to okay, because you had to retake a couple of courses or, Maybe you failed one or got a low score or got a C and then you retook it and you got an A. We actually do look at that. It's not like we just look at the final number and, and go, it, the final number is the final number. Um, and But again, right, if you your GPA was low and to begin with and it stayed a little bit low, even if you retook the class, it's probably not going to help you. But if it gets you to a GPA where we look at your application, then yes, that's taken into consideration. Uh, oh, I knew this question was coming. <laughs> Do you take out of state applicants? I don't care. Most schools don't care. That is a myth that, that we won't take you if you're out of state. But again, much like I said before, if 95 or, or not 95, but if 90% of my kids, I, I call you guys my kids cause I have enough gray hair, um, apply, um, from California schools, then it's likely that the roster is going to be 90% made of kids from California. I don't really care where you came from as long as it is a reasonably legitimate, uh, you know, certified accredited school. I don't care if it's Squeedunk, Michigan. I really don't care. And I made up that Squeedunk, Michigan. I don't really know that there is a Squeedunk, Michigan, but I'm just kind of, it just counts, sounds kind of like from the middle of nowhere. Um, and, and so I don't care. So, so, um, that's something. Oh, and the other thing, the other question I get a lot is, do we really care if you came from a UC school versus a Cal State school? Don't care. Um, do I care if you started at Cal State and ended up at a UC school? Don't care. Um, so none of those are things that should keep you from thinking that you're automatically going to get second classed um, if, if you put that on your application. Um, what about community college? What if students started or took the prereq requirements? At a yeah, don't care if you took some of your prereq courses during a summer program to you know make up for it because you couldn't do it. You know, some some kids do that. Don't care. Um, uh, again, as long as it's accredited and as long as it's legit. Uh, and again, like I said, if you started two years anywhere else and then went to a UC school, not a problem. Um, 
should I her successful transfer service last second to be considered for medical school? All right. Again, this transfer thing, you just mentioned it. The problem with the transfer stuff is if you started with a low GPA and you kept a low GPA for whatever reason, you know, it, it's probably not going to, but if you spent your first two years knocking stuff out, because we also do recognize that some kids just can't afford to go all the way, you know, to, to a private school or, or even an expensive UC school. Um, and so we appreciate that they got a lot of their prereqs out of the way uh, and then transferred to a UC school. Don't, don't, um, don't, don't think you're at an automatic disadvantage there. Um, I, in terms of like specific courses, talk to your counselors, talk to your counselors, talk to your counselors. Um, because, um, I wish that was one thing that I would have done, uh, when I was an undergrad. I mean, I, I, I went straight from undergrad to medical school, so I shouldn't complain, but I had a terrible counselor or I just didn't know how to write or, or, or ask all the right questions. Um, and, and so ask your school provided counselor, number one, and ask other legitimate people. Don't ask Reddit. Don't ask uh, Instagram. Don't ask because you're going to get a lot of information that is not helpful and not legitimate. It's just based on anecdotal evidence. And so my first starting point from you guys is, is start with um, the counselors that are provided at whatever school you're going to. And and, and if their quest the answers don't sound quite right, um, ask for a second opinion. I mean, there's like, you know, you're not going to get, you're not going to hurt anybody, but, but, um, ask questions, ask questions, ask questions. Um, and that, that's my best advice that I can give you there. Um, uh, I don't care when and where you do your prereqs, uh, is one question that was there. Um, Ooh, that one's a loaded question. Let me see if I can get back to that. Um, should I go back to, oh, how do I feel about a gap year? <laughs> um, that's a very complicated question. I'm actually, believe it or not, doing a research project on that right now. Um, I think it has become increasingly competitive. And so this is what I tell people. If you are one of those lucky people that not only have you done your coursework, but you've been able to do the research and you've been able to do the clinical activity and you've done it for a year plus and you've gotten, you know, hundreds of hours of it. Um, then don't worry about taking a gap year. Your gap year is, is, and, and I think what my research research is probably going to show is that unfortunately the kids who are at a disadvantage, um, and whether that's economically or culturally or, or whatever reason they're at a disadvantage, um, have to take that gap year because they can't afford their rent and their scholarship or their tuition and their books and everything without getting a job. And so if you're busy working to feed yourself and pay for your tuition and buy your books and all the things that life entails, then you're not going to have the opportunity to do all of those things that I just mentioned. And so I, I, I'm thinking that my research, but research is research. And sometimes the answer surprise you is that the kids who are disadvantaged are the ones that are paying quote unquote a tax of having to take a gap year just to compete with the other kids that were able to do hundreds of hours of research and clinical exposure and community service um, all at the same time. So do I recommend it? I'm not the biggest fan, but again, you can go to some of these schools and and, and ask their admissions committees like, well, or you can look at their website uh, and, and say, um, if you um, met their average criteria for what they're looking for, then put the application in because here's my next question, which I don't know, it's been, uh, or my next answer to a question that may not have been asked yet is, um, what if I don't get in? What if I apply and I don't get in? Did I embarrass myself? Or did I completely block myself out of being considered again in the future? Nope. Um, the one thing I care about in that situation is you didn't get in. You looked at your application and you looked at what the perceived weaknesses were in, in your application that didn't get you in. And you worked on those during this now forced to be taken gap year. Um, and did you go and like, oh, maybe I didn't have enough hours in 
um, you know, clinical exposure. Let me go do that. Well, maybe I had zero on my research and everything else looked pretty good. Let me go find somebody to do research with. Um, and, uh, in other words, you showed grit, you showed introspection and you worked on your application through a perceived weakness. Um, and, um, as opposed to like, oh, I didn't get in. So I decided to go find myself backpacking in Europe. Well, then you wasted your gap year and I'm going to know that. And I'm, I'm not going to take that into consideration. So, um, it's what you did with your gap year if you didn't get in. Um, and, uh, that's my advice for that portion of the program. The other thing that kind of annoys me, which I often see is if you already had a good GPA and you already had, um, a good MCAT and, you actually had a reasonably good application. And then I see the kid like retakes the MCAT and improves their percentile from 85th percentile to 92nd percentile. I can guarantee you it wasn't your MCAT. There was potentially a personality issue there. And in terms of that, I mean, you didn't have a good personal, uh, a good personal statement or secondaries, or you flubbed your interview, right? And so you should ask and you should confirm with people, hey, do I have a good interview style? Maybe practice interviews. Um, or have somebody take a look at your personal statement and make sure that you didn't write anything that was either off or just didn't make sense. Um, and, and, and so don't, like I said, then there wasn't much introspection there. So you should, again, approach your counselors and say, well, why do you think I didn't get in? What should I be doing to get in next time? Um, Dr. Barrio, I know yeah. that you mentioned this, but we have like three more questions about this. If you take your prereqs at a community college, are you at a disadvantage and do you accept them? I know you don't mentioned care, this. Don't care, don't care, don't care. Um, because we do recognize that some kids can't afford to take all of their courses at, at you know, a specific expensive school or or do it in the summer. That's fine. I, I, I just honestly, it's, it's not a thing. Um... Again, okay, so I kind of sort of answered this already, but pursuing a gap year to do clinical research. Again, you either do it as research or do it as clinical. And some people say, oh, this was clinical, but really all they did was analyze labs um, and do some stats. And even though it was a clinical research project, they didn't actually really have any patient contact. Um, so gauge it. If your clinical research, actually, if the if the person tells me, well, I had to enroll patients and I had to do their vitals and maybe I drew my own samples. Uh, and, and then yes, then you were clinically involved in touching patients, then you can, you can claim that as clinical as opposed to research. And if you want to divvy it up and say, half my time was spent in the lab and half my time was spent, was spent doing patient care, then, then divvy the hours up and clearly tell me that you're divvying the hours up. Um, so that I get that sense that that it was both. But most of the projects and most of the job descriptions tend to be either really clinical or really basic science in the lab, even though it, patients are involved. So, so you you have to determine that. I can't determine that for you. But on the other hand, this is yeah, this is something that um, I, I, I don't, Doctor um, Barrios. Like healthcare is a very regulated thing in the U.S. and certainly California. So if you're touching a patient, like not giving him like a blanket, but actually like doing blood pressure, drawing blood, um, doing bandages, putting on splints, like you have to be certified. There's some sort of certification, EMT, medical assistant, something. So if you don't have that, then you can't say, oh, I showed up and I was taking blood pressure is at a health fair. And that was it. It's like, okay, but you're not really certified or say, oh, I went to, I went to Nicaragua for two weeks with a doctor and he was letting me do gallbladders and appies and stuff like that. Well, that's kind of like it, you're not really certified to do that. And so again, it, just think about that as, as kind of like what you could say that you're doing clinically. Um, I guess a lot of people get confused by that, but you know, giving a blanket to a patient in the in the ER is not clinical experience. Yes. Yeah, that's that's going to fall under your community service. I mean, and there's actually a tab for that that says community service clinical, um, and, and that's where things like that are going to fall under. Um, what are the amount of hours? Again, being vague, right? Um, Square root of seven thousand nine hundred. 
Yeah, exactly. But, but, you know, hundreds and hundreds of hours as opposed to 40 hours. Um, and I would rather you see, a, do see you do a long-term thing than, um, than a bunch of different small projects, because now I just know you're checking off boxes that don't even make sense. And, 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 and let me delve into that even a little bit more. Like one of my favorite things, one of my favorite examples that I give is a um, student who spent a lot of hours doing um, an activity where she was teaching autistic kids how to ride horses, kind of a niche thing. But why did she do that? Because she had a sibling who was autistic and she liked riding horses. So she found an, an activity that was consistent with her story. Um, and she had skin in the game. I would rather see you do something like that than try to say, oh, well, I did Habitat for Humanity for one summer. And then I did Camp Kesson for Cancer Kids in one summer. And then I uh, worked on a hospice for one other summer. I mean, like, there's no stick to itiveness. There's no logic to it other than, um, you know, you're, you're, you're trying to check off the boxes. And, you know, after years and years of expertise in my committee, like, we, we can spot that kind of thing. Um, uh, there see. was there was a bunch of questions about like time limits so like when you completed an activity like how many years ago would you uh, suggest like keeping on your application and same thing for college. like prerequisite courses as well college just anything don't put high school stuff on there i mean the only time i put high school stuff on there or i accept and it's kind of fun to, to watch is if you did stuff like you know, Eagle Scout or Girl Scout or something like that, where obviously you, you kind of start to start to fall off after, you know, when you go to college. Um, but most of your activities, I wouldn't really, really, unless they was continuing forward from something that you did as a, as a teenager, but we generally don't look at things that happened in high school. Um, that, that, that's our kind of our, our cutoff. Um, I cannot explain that formula because it's a matter of the computer telling me, well, if you got this low GPA, but that higher MCAT, or you got a higher GPA and a lower MCAT, or both of them were low. So it's like, like the computer does that for us. And, and there are certain low cutoffs below which I can't help you. Um, but I, I, I am not privy to telling you that. So again, if I sound vague, it's because it's supposed to be vague. Um, otherwise I would tell you straight up what the exact numbers were or, or what the, formula looks like but you know i i can't do that um yeah and i just want to throw this out there and i know some pre-meds do this as well you say oh my god i found out this person with a 3.1 got into uc irvine you know that person may have many 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 or 3.2 or whatever x number i'm just throwing out this number yeah that's like some like you should you know those are like the outliers and there's a lot of outliers in life yeah. Um, and we're and, gonna go into that for a minute too. Yeah. Um, uh, so I'm glad you brought that up. But I'm gonna ask one question here that that um, yeah, withdrawals don't do too many of those. Um, how many experiences should we ideally have? Again, vague, I don't know, two, three, but but don't do 10 or 12 because then that becomes obvious. Um, and again, just continuity. If you do have hundreds and hundreds of hours and two really good solid things, that's better than, you know, four 20 hour things or 10, 20 hour things. Um, uh, um, let's talk about that GPA. There is a certain GPA below which we will not consider you. However, there are a couple of little caveats. We will look at slightly lower GPAs for our mission-based programs, which is a UCI thing, right? We have Prime LC, which is for the Latino community. And we have Prime Lead ABC, which is for the African, Black and, and Caribbean community. Um, those can apply separately going into that. And um, we do recognize that a lot of those applicants are probably disadvantaged themselves. And that's why they are interested in working with disadvantaged communities. And so we'll, we'll slightly lower our um, requirements, but we're not going to lower them below a point, which we know you're going to struggle anyways. There is a, there is a, and again, I'm not going to say it, there is a magic number on the MCAT below which we we just don't because we know you're going to struggle and there is um uh, so that's what i can mention about that so yeah maybe that person got in with a 3.1 but their activities were and their life story was completely ridiculously amazing and they've proven that they're going to work with disadvantaged communities and maybe their mcat was better than their gpa so again anecdotal evidence don't just go by the one 
grade um, or the one MCAT score or the one activity that you did for 500 hours or, you know, it just, again, it just, it's a very, very, very complex formula, a little bit frustrating. You have to do a little bit of homework. You have to go to the schools and see what they're interested in. I, I know some schools that say, I don't care if they do any research at all. It's not in, it's not involved in our formula. UCI prides itself on its research and most of the UC schools do. So you're probably going to, you know, help yourself by doing some research and get yourself some points there. Um, all schools have financial counselors. Um, uh, avail yourself of those. There are scholarships, there are grants, there are loans. Um, there are opportunities uh, to help pay for your tuition. And what I need to tell you there is just talk to your counselor when it, the, that specific counselor, the financial advisor, they, every school will have one so that you can work on it. Um, um, uh, what else do we have? Um, so, so, and also going into the, like, you know, the, the diversity stuff and how that was affected by the SCOTUS. Um, so California has a very, very long standing rule that, um, we really couldn't do race-based quotas to begin with. So that was never part of our formula. The thing that can be asked is, do the, does this person have a unique life experience? Very vague. What is a unique life experience? Your unique life experience may have been some sort of, again, economic, social, whatever, uh, you know, cultural, my parents immigrated type of factor. Um, and, and, and so that allows us that wiggle room of diversity, right? Um, without saying like, I'm going to take so many people from this diverse niche or that diverse niche, we can still work with, because I mean, let's be honest, a lot of people that have um, a story of disadvantage or struggle are probably going to be from some minority of some sort. And, and so it, that that's where the wiggle room comes in in California. So to be honest with you, the only difference that we made um, for our application process was we used to plaster your picture on the application on the first page and we took the picture out so that people can look at your application without being biased um, by what you may or may not look like. Um, and uh, that's really kind of been the only real change for us. Um, in terms of how we consider our, our, our diversity. Um, uh, let me see, what might I have missed? Uh, let me see, where we have got great, where would we address why we may have got it here? Yeah, you can either do that in your personal statement, uh, why, why you might've had a bad semester. You can do it in your, um, if your secondaries include a um, adversity question, uh, there's usually a spot for um, uh, why would you feel that you were from a disadvantaged group? It's it's in there somewhere, um, and and so just look for it. And again, if all you can put it is in your personal statement, put it in your personal statement. However, I do caution you to be careful. Don't go from, hey, listen, I had a bad semester because something bad happened to me, to woe is me, um, because uh, then that's not so good. Then you're, then to be honest with you, like the, the term I'm going to use and then you're whining, uh, don't like that. Um, and here, hold on, I'm going to turn my light on cause I'm starting to get in the dark here and I'm starting to look like a ghost. Oh, this may put my face in shadow a little bit. Let me see if I can make that better. I, I know this routine. Hold on. Now you're going to get to see my den. Uh All right, there we go. Hey, look, I look like a real person again. Um, you so, went to a new room. Yeah. <laughs> um, so, uh, uh, oh, here's another question. Um, uh, mental health, tricky question. We are not allowed to make decisions about 
people's health, and that includes mental health, unless it impacts their ability to perform uh, the tasks and the job that is required of them, right? So I, I can't um, allow myself to, to use medical conditions um, to factor into that if you say that you're capable of going forward now caveat right if you say you had an issue with mental health but you're under control and this was something in your past or, or it's something that you've now worked on um that's fine if however it's something um that you are telling me up front it's going to be an ongoing issue and you put that in your statement that's on you um uh because we do have to consider are, are, are you likely to drop out are you likely to have some sort of issue that you're not going to be able to complete the program, um, then, uh, I mean, that's more of a subtle thing. So if you had a history of it, you got yourself under control. Like I, I see that all the time, actually, like, you know, people who tell me they had, you know, anxiety or they had, uh, you know, bulimia or anorexia and they got over it. And now they're actually kind of even sort of interested in, in, in working in adolescent health and nutrition and, 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 or psychiatry, then that actually helps. Um, and 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 doesn't hurt because then it becomes true to your story. So take it with a little bit of a grain of salt, but it's not a deal breaker. Um, how do you stand out in your application? Part of, part of life is we all have things that happen. We have family members that die. We have breakups. We have oh, you know, financial. You know, so everybody has that. But it's just how do you handle it and yeah, how do you exactly. persistent and exactly resilient. How you, how you overcame it. Because uh, I'm sorry to say this, and, and Dr. Barrios, can you attest to this? Once you get your MD, those things do not go away, <laughs> right? What was that now? Once you get your MD, those things don't go away, like loss of family, heartbreak, financial challenges. Oh, no. People people struggle in their personal lives throughout, right? Now, you're you, this is the part where you get to see me move around my house. So, um, because I just, the kitchen activities are starting and I don't want it to interfere in the background. Um, so uh, let's see, what else? Uh, but yeah, all of those challenges happen in your life. And if you could handle them now, hopefully when you're a physician, you could handle them as well. Yeah, exactly, exactly. So um, let's, let's pick this room. I think we should be fine. Um, how do you stand out? You know, the things that... that again, make you stand out are things, um, and we kind of touched on them a little bit, is like, were you an athlete? Are you some sort of performer? Um, and and I, I personally like things that make you different than everybody else. What makes you different, right? Because this last year, I'll tell you, this last year I read 370 applications. What made anybody stand out? You know, did they have some sort of activity that was unique? Um, did they play an instrument? Did they play sports? Um, did they, you know, it could be anything. Um, you know, you were a famous chef or, or, you know, you, you, you know, studied at the UN as a, you know, whatever, like, like those are the kind of things. So I, I don't care so much what you did on your application and your activity section rather. And by that, I mean, that's all fine and dandy, but that doesn't make you different than anybody else. What makes you, you that's different and that's unique. And then, and, and how do you convey that? I just literally yesterday had a one-on-one -on -one with somebody who kind of sort of asked me about the personal statement and all that. And I said, you know, don't do, I did this and this and this, I called it the laundry list. I did this and this and this and this and this, and that's why I'm ready to go to medical school. No, that, that doesn't make you ready to go to medical school. What made you unique? And so I started asking him questions of like, well, what do you do in your spare time, right? And and his answer was he liked to paint. And I said, well, why do you like to paint? He goes, well, it's a memory that I had with my mother because my mother used to like to paint because we are immigrants from another country and she would paint scenes from her childhood so that I can get an idea of, of where we came from. And I picked up on that. And like, now I like to paint. I'm like, well, that that's what you put in your personal statement that makes you stand out. Right. And, and maybe you can tie that to, you know, you're painting a picture of the patient's medical history when you're asking them all these questions about what their medical history was. And, and you're kind of putting that together like you would a painting. Right. And that's, that's the kind of thing that I like. 
and that makes you stand out, um, you know, and, and anyways, I won't belabor that, but that's the kind of thing I'm talking about when I, um, do you have any tips for interviews during the application? Oh my God, yes. Be you, be normal, have good conversation flow. Don't be stiff, make good eye contact. I know eye contact nowadays when you're doing everything by by Zoom is kind of a little bit hard, but stare at the little green light or blue light or red light or whatever the light it is into the camera so you are talking or at least when you're interviewing, put the face of the person that you're talking to near where the camera is, like towards the top of the screen usually so that you're making eye contact. Don't look off into space. Normal speech patterns. Don't hesitate. Don't, you know, have a normal speech pattern. Have have normal range of emotions. Don't be stiff. Don't uh, be introverted. Um, keep the conversation going. There's nothing more awful to me than to try to interview somebody and it's like pulling teeth because they answer with a one or two word answer uh, and they, they don't elaborate and they don't go back and forth. So practice with somebody like normal human interaction skills is what I am looking for when you interview and including a good range of motion, light sense of humor, don't get carried away. But it's okay, relax before you go into the interview. It's okay. Um, oh, actually about that, does UCI School of Medicine uh, do um, in-person interviews? Like what's the format for interviews? Yeah, no, we are Zoom. Everything is Zoom. And is it MMI or traditional? What was that now? Sorry, is it MMI or traditional? Uh, oh, no, it's traditional one-on-one. -on -one. You're going to talk to a student. You're going to talk to a faculty member. You're going to have a group session where you're going to be asked like a kind of fun question. Like, like, hey, tell me something about you that, that you know, uh, is a fun fact or something. I mean, it's, I think, our go-to. And, and, and again, like, it's like, do you allow other people to speak one at a time? Do you bully people? Do you sit back there and you never say anything during the group session? But it's all, but it's all Zoom. But but the actual interviews are one on one. Um, if you could tell your your younger self or even undergraduate self one piece of advice, I absolutely and I already actually said it. Ask questions. Ask questions. Ask questions. Ask questions. I don't care. Annoy people um, with your questions. But if you don't know what you don't know then you're going to end up struggling a little bit. Um, then um, you're going to struggle a little bit. And, and the way that I, I, I actually struggled a little bit and I wish I hadn't. And I think I would have not struggled as much as I did if I had just asked a lot of questions and annoyed some people doing it. Like I, I, I have no problem annoying people with questions now. So. Now the only caveat I would just say this is that don't email or call questions that have been posted like if they've taken the time of writing it and putting it on a website and editing it and stuff like that i just you know there's a lot of information that are like posted for both legal reasons but also just so yeah that's the only caveat that i would just say is that if they you know yeah be realistic with your questions too. have a good well thought out question don't just ask random questions that don't matter um just say so. like you know does you know don't email them you know or call them and say do you guys use the amcas system for the application system or something like that yeah, yeah exactly um uh let's see uh how did i become the dean of admissions you know what it's really funny and i'm going to relate you know the stories that everybody always tells you of like the way to be successful in any job is to be present. Um, and so that's 80% of the job right there. Just show up and be consistent. I've gotten a lot of the positions I have at work because I was there. Like, so my Dean of Admissions thing happened when, because I did years and years of being on the committee and then I showed up every single time. Um, and uh, when the person who was the one before me retired, like I didn't even ask for the job. They approached me and said, hey, you're the only one that ever actually showed up all the time. It seems like you're interested. Would you like the position? So I was actually asked. And that's actually how I've gotten half of the jobs that I do around UCI. Um, and, and so be present, be there, be committed. 
um, and, and, and you'll get there and do things that are of interest to you. Like the jobs that I take and the job descriptions that I have are jobs that I like. And early on in my career, I did a few positions that I didn't care for. And one of them I did get because, I, again, I was literally the only one that would ever show up. And then, you know, when my term was over in two years, it was like, oh, I can't take this anymore. So now I, I, I have the privilege of, of being able to um, pick and choose the ones I want. But my best advice to you is if you're going to commit to something, commit to it and do it. And, and, and you'll be able to work your way towards whatever your goals are. I don't care what they are, but as long as, you know, uh, you're committed. Um, yeah. I think Sun Tzu's art of war says, how, you know, in order to become a general or field commander, you have to be a good soldier and, you know. Yeah. Um, how do you feel about late versus early applicants? Uh, I've kind of changed my tune on this a little bit do the best that you can to really meet that deadline or, or when they, when the gates open, throw your application in. Um, because I used to say it didn't really matter at all, but it kind of sort of does a little bit. And, and by that, I mean, because it's all computerized now, it, you know, when you file is, is, you know, you're, you're putting a queue and we do, I'll just say this, we are a little bit meaner at the end of the year than we're at the beginning of the year. And that's just human nature because um, we say, now we're looking for people who are really extraordinary because we've only got a few more spots to fill. So is there a little bit of a bias of like, okay, we're a little bit meaner at the end of the year? Yeah, now and that's not to say that if you don't apply on day one, you're not gonna get in, but also don't apply in, in you know, by December, unless your application's like, really remarkably spectacular you probably did yourself a disservice so being late a day a couple of weeks a month probably okay um but really really late in the cycle you're probably done yourself a disservice uh what are the hard nose in a personal statement in your opinion um never ever talk politics never ever talk uh religion um avoid what you would perceive to be controversial issues we actually just ran into this recently with a with an applicant talking a lot about how they worked at an abortion center um controversial um so those those are no's and here's an okay so here's another fun no that it, that well not a fun no but an interesting no at least in my part and I've, and i've trust me the committee all see it the same way and i and i will repeat myself here because i've said it all like a hundred times I know that your grandparents are or were special to you. After reading two years ago, two, two cycles ago, I read a thousand application. After reading 500 applications of somebody's sick grandparent, they are not special to me. I know that's harsh, but you're doing yourself a disfavor because again, I'm going to go back to how do you stand out? writing about your sick grandparents may have been a motivation to you. Now, if it was really, really a factor, please, by all means, put that in somewhere in the statement, but don't start off with, I'm going to rattle off this, the, the personal statement that is a complete turnoff for me. I remember when I was young, and I'm making this up, this didn't really happen, but I, I, I made this up um, because this is kind of sort of how it works is like, I remember playing checkers with my grandma and then she had a stroke and couldn't move her arm anymore or couldn't remember how to play anymore. And then I decided that I wanted to know what the underpinnings of Alzheimer's was. So I worked in somebody's lab. And then I realized that I didn't get the personal feeling from knowing the basic science. So I volunteered at um, an Alzheimer's, you know, assisted living facility. But then I realized that that wasn't enough. And I really wanted to know how to care medically for these people. So I decided to work in a doctor's office who was a neurologist. And after all that, now I know I'm ready for med school because like, okay, you know what? That's fine. I've read half of my applications. The personal statement is like that. Avoid that by all means. Um, that is my best advice to you. Avoid specific topics that are controversial and then uh, don't do what I call the laundry list or the sick grandparent because it, it just didn't help me see who you are differently than all of the other applicants. Uh, can you see if a student is applying to multiple schools, does this hurt their chances? Not a thing. I can't tell where you're applying. And actually they used to give us more data, but then they kind of took that away from us. So 
I don't even really know. So nowadays, I don't even really know if you already got accepted to another school or not. We used to have that information. We don't anymore. So I don't care. Apply to 100 schools. And I know you want to get in somewhere. So I don't care how many schools you apply to. Um, yeah, past no during COVID was a little frustrating for us because it took away data points, but it's going away and it, and it's okay. It doesn't really, really matter. Um, as long as you're now getting back to some sort of GPA, but there was like a semester of pass fail, that's fine. The, 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 we took that into consideration. Um, if you are a scribe, works alongside a doctor, can you put those hours as both shadowing? Oh, please, your God, don't do that. No. If that was an employment and you worked as a scribe, you worked as a scribe. Don't say that you shadowed as well. Go shadow somebody else because that that's 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 what we call the double dip. Um, and, and so even if you say, well, I worked 2000 hours with the doctor because I worked with him for a whole year, but then I also did some shadowing. No, you didn't. You worked as a scribe. I mean, that was your job. So, uh, that to me is kind of an eyeball role. Um, so sorry if that one sounded a little bit negative, but, but yeah, you're going to hurt yourself on that one. If you, if you try to do the double dip, uh, much like I was talking about the clinical research, uh, Bad experience in another country making detection in poor communities. That's going to fall under community service, and that's fine. Or that's if you want to call that clinical, that's fine too. We tend to, uh, I would put that under community service medical is what I would do with that one because we kind of sort of like, okay, that's great that you had that experience, um, but that doesn't at the same time, show you how medicine happens in the United States. So there's a little bit of a grain of salt with that, but we do accept it as experience. Um, it, 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 we, we will consider it. Um, what does clinical volunteering look like in a hospital? They have so many different programs. I mean, there's ones where, again, all you're doing is passing out cookies and blankets, and then there's ones where you're transporting patients, and then there's ones where you're a greeter, uh, or then there's ones where the nurses are telling you, you know, please do this for me, please do that for me. I would do my homework before I started volunteering for any of those. Um, let's see. Yeah, I just put a, we did a two hour session on like clinical experience and all the things you could do under the sun and how to find them. Um, you know, there's hundreds of things you could do. There's like doulas, for example, if you're interested in women's health, you can become a certified doula, I think, in like 28 hours, yeah. you know, and it's a great and you could actually like some areas you could make like a thousand dollars working as a doula for one family, you know. So. Yeah. 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 And again, that takes me back to go talk to your counselors, go talk to your advisors, because they're going to have that information of opportunities that are out there uh, in, in, in whatever you're trying to figure out. I work as an MA. You work as an MA. That's clinical experience. Um doesn't matter what you really um get certified you could actually do it um i put yeah. that in the chat yeah if and you're that's working and that's clinical yeah. yeah and that's clinical exposure you're working as a as a as a person who's working interacting with patients um is leadership involvement uh like student government a good thing to write about yeah that's perfectly fine um and you can put that under your you know they have either like a, it's, you can be like a leadership tab or you can be um, community service, not clinical. Um, but yes, that's, that's, if you really had a good experience with that and you're trying to say how that helped you in some sort of way of formulating who you are, then by all means um, uh, list it and, and put it under, like I said, leadership or something like that. Um are transfers like they did their first years i couldn't tell you that number transfers versus not transfers again all i can tell you is it's not an it's not as big a deal as you would think it is uh, and, and and i know everybody and i'm saying that because everybody thinks it's a really big deal and to be honest with you it's not um yeah because you guys have read it or heard it from someone and you guys keep repeating it um dr barrio how many times have you come here now I think this is my third or fourth one. No, it's probably it's your fifth time. So this is the <laughs> fifth time that you've been here. And he knows that we're target community college students. And I could just say this, and I'm comfortable enough to say this. Um, he knows that you guys are community college students. He could always say no, he doesn't want to come. But every time I've asked him to come, he's come. 
because he he does care and he wants to at his school he doesn't need to do any more recruiting because he already gets 7000 applications each time so for an hour and a half that he's giving up his time like he does want you there so you guys are yeah, asking no, these questions it, what's it, that's actually a really good point. If I thought you had no chance, I wouldn't bother and I wouldn't be coming here telling you how to try to get in because I just uh, or I would show up and go in three minutes. This lecture would have been over and I would have said, uh, don't bother because you're never getting in. So um, that's not the case or 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 I'm only going to take one percent. Like if hey, that was really true, then like why make you go through all these efforts to to then have you not be able to to uh, have a chance to get in? So so, yeah, put put that one aside. Don't don't think too much about that one and on top of it city of california is spending a lot of money to get community college students in the medical school so you know um, i don't have preferences on clinical experiences i think i mentioned it earlier um things like scribing is really popular now emt not just the certification but actually being an emt um medical assistants nursing assistants uh working in somebody's office uh, th that's all like again did you have patient contact of some sort um, and did you see how the medical experience was for patients? That's what we're looking for. Um, so there's a couple of questions about personal statements. Um, do you suggest like, how many people do you suggest looking over your personal statement? And then do you suggest like school counselors, like who as well? Yeah. I mean, again, if you have an advisor that's being paid by your school to be your advisor, go take it to your advisor. You have a couple of friends, take a look at it because sometimes it really is just a matter of like, you think it sounds really good and it makes sense, but somebody might look at it or one of your friends says, you know, well, this doesn't make any sense. What does this mean? Um, you know, don't take it to 20 people, but but just also don't not have somebody else take a look at it. So maybe a counselor, maybe a friend or two, um, just to make sure that it sounds okay and looks okay um, b before you submit it and make sure all the spelling is correct. Believe it or not, if I look at it and I see a syntax error and I'm like, that's how obnoxious I am, I, I'm sorry. But if I see a syntax error or a misspelling, I'm like, okay, you didn't even bother to use like spell check. Um, uh, it's a turn off. Um, there's a different, there is a difference between, and, and then I leave everybody individually. There's a difference between saying like, hey, I'm good stuff versus like, oh, I know I'm good, right? You know the difference between bragging and and pointing out the things that you've done um, can be picked up on. And again, that goes back to have somebody take a look at it and go, dude, you sound egotistical. You sound like you're bragging, you know? Um, one of the things that we do warn people to be careful about is like the, the white savior con, you know, concept. Um, don't be the one that goes like, oh, I went to go work in a poor community and only because of me were they able to pull themselves out of, of whatever dire situation they're in. And like, uh, okay, that's eh, taking it too far. Um, but, you know, did you have one good personal uh, memory from that experience? It's to globally saying, you know, well, I put a cape on and, uh, you know, flew into the projects and and, and saved everybody there. Yeah. Eh, no, eh. um, does the personal statement matter less if GPA and MCAT is high? No, but here's our formula for how we deal with this because I, I will give you this, the, the really skinny, dirty truth is I maybe don't completely 100% read every single word through the initial screening process. Um, and this is why, like, yes, I'm going to look at it and yes, I'm going to pick things out of it. Um, and I know that's kind of harsh because I know you guys put your blood, sweat and tears into these things. Um, but I, I can't, I don't have the time to read every single word of every single personal statement, but here's what my reasoning is, right? If your application in your GPA is really good and your MCAT's really good, there's probably not too much that you can put into your personal statement. That's going to ruin it for me. If your application just doesn't already meet the muster. And I know I'm really going to have a hard time accepting you for an interview, there's probably not much you can put in the personal statement that's going to make me change my mind. Now, when does it become really more important for me to look at your uh, personal statement, even at the screening stage, is if I'm kind of waffling, like their application is kind of sort of okay, like maybe yes, maybe no, um, let me look at the personal statement. And that's why, or that's when your personal statement makes a difference, 
right? Because that might push you over the edge if you had like a really cool, interesting personal statement. Now, at the very end, when you've already done the interview and now it's the final committee and we're looking at all your transcripts and we're looking at your activities and we're looking at all the interviews that you did and we're looking at your personal statements. I don't care if you had a 4.0 and a 99% on your MCAT, but if the interviewer, faculty interview and student interviewer, and we actually do a video interview online that we make you guys do where you answer a couple of questions to help us in there. And you come across as not a, I don't know, like, not a nice person for one reason or another, whether you're, you know, uh, I'll leave it at that. But that's when people, and again, I kind of mentioned that earlier where people have no introspection into like, they didn't come across very well and, and that's what hurt them. So, and, and and the things that go into that writer, like, did you brag too much? Or were you too introverted? Like, if you are so introverted that you can't have a normal conversation, how are you going to advocate for your patient when they come to you and you need to call somebody that is an expert in whatever their problem is and you can't advocate for them? So that's when personality skills and issues and personal statements come in is, uh, you know, Again, and I, I kind of joke, but I was like, if you're going to be an accountant or if you're going to be an engineer, I kind of don't care what your personality is because you're not going to be dealing with other people. But you are dealing with sick, scared, in pain people, and you have to be empathetic and you have to be able to express that and you have to be able to be an advocate for them if you need to send them to somebody else. And, and that's when the personality becomes important. And I kind of also joke too, like, and I don't care if like, you know, for lawyers, you can be a jerk. And my brother's a lawyer. And so that's all I'm always saying that. But 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 that's not true for our field. And, and as cliche as it is, it is a people person field. And so you have to be an empathetic, normal range of emotion advocate for your patient. And and so we don't underestimate that. Uh, yeah, because literally you walk into a patient's room and within probably, what, 30 seconds, you're doing something to them, either an exam or a suture or something like that. So you got to be able to put them at ease. Because if you show up and you're scared, then they're going to be like, oh my God, this person's going to like, you know, you got to be confident, but also not like have good bedside matters. Yeah. So, you, have to, you have to have this person trust you. Yep. Um, and, and again, mind you, and sometimes like you're literally within minutes, you're walking into the room and you're saying, take your clothes off. Um, so you have to be, you know, empathetic, you have to be understanding, you have to be professional. Um, and, and we take that into consideration when we're trying to figure out who we are going to accept into medical school. What makes UCI stand out? I think that several of the things that we, and this is actually a really good question in the sense that UCI in particular really is very, um, it's kind of warm and fuzzy um, is one way to put it. Like we really pick people that are going to be empathetic and that like as students, like the students hang out with each other, the faculty hang out with each other. Um, um, and, and we have a congenial, I mean, it's not always, you know, puppies and rainbows, but, but it is a pleasant working environment. Now, aside from the personality of the program, you know, uh, we have things like, uh-oh. This. That can't be good. Um, if you, uh, where was I going with this? Oh, so the, what research heavy? We pride ourselves on that. A lot of research gets pumped out. Um, some of the things that we do for the students, like provide laptops, the sim lab, um, a lot of different things that. Um, hold on, this is probably gonna. Oh, bummer. Okay, I know what that's about. Um, uh, the point that I'm getting at there is like, yes, there's some of the things that UCI considers itself very strongly about a good atmosphere, good teaching, sim, uh, laptops, research. Where I'm going with this is each and every time you're going to apply to a different school, go to their websites figure out what they are proud of. It's going to be on the website. Um, and, and so do your homework. And I don't care if you're lying through your teeth when you say, oh, I really want to come to your school because you guys are so good at X or you focus on X. And I don't care if you really, on the inside, you're going like, I hate X. But on the outside, 
at least have done your homework because there's nothing more annoying to me than I ask the question of, well, well why UCI? And you say, the weather's fantastic, location, I'm close to my family. Well, yes, those are all fine and dandy, but if you didn't even put any effort in to figure out what UCI is about, then I'm not gonna take your answer as seriously. So yes, you can still say, at the end of it, like, I like this and this and this and this and this. Oh, and by the way, it just coincidentally also will be nice because I'll have support from my family if um, I go here. That, that's that's fine and that's legit because there is a little teeny bit of factoring of like, is this kid likely to come to UCI if I pick them or not, right? Because if you lived back east and you studied back east and all your family's back east and all of a sudden you're applying to UCI, I'm like, really? Like, like why are you so interested in UCI? Like, and so... Um, is that a, like, that's one of the, like the minor factors, but, but it's taken into consideration. And again, how do I pick out of the 4,000 kids that had a viable application? All right. Um, this is a question somebody put in there. They said, how do you gain all of those things that you talked about? Like personable, being able to talk to people and stuff like that. Okay. Yeah. I would, I would let the answer and I'll have to. Right. By the it. time you are 21 years old, your personality is set. Um, you are who you are. I can't turn you overnight from an introvert to an extrovert. I can't have you be an uncomfortable robotic person and all of a sudden turn into like the life of the party. However, there are some things you can do to help you. Um, and I've seen it on the applications. I've seen kids say, well, I used to be more of an introvert and then I took dance classes or I played on a basketball team and, or I went to Toastmasters and I learned how to do public speaking. Um, or I put myself in situations where I was working on what I was uncomfortable with. There are things out there that you can do to help you and then to change some of the aspects of your personality. Um, and, and I actually kind of sort of like to see that too, like kind of like, Oh, well, this person realized that they had a perceived deficit and they worked on it. Um, and, you know, and again, there are things out there, like, like I said, Toastmasters, go join a local basketball team, uh, go join, uh, you know, a book reading club and participate. Like, I don't care what it is. Um, as long as you worked on what the perceived weakness might be, um, Toastmasters is a good thing for public speaking. That's literally all they do, um, is, is put you up in front of an audience. I, I don't know. Go, go to poetry slam night at your local Tuesday night bar, uh, um, in other words, there's, as long as it's within reason and professional, um, there's probably not going to much you're going to do to hurt yourself as opposed to writing, well, Hey, I worked on this because I knew it was a problem for me and this is how I made myself better, um, for the interview process and the personal statement process. Um, but the only thing that I would just add is that you've got to put yourself in, in positions that you're not comfortable and do stuff like, like, I, I don't know, like I had a friend of mine who um, his grandparents, like, this is going to grandparents, had Alzheimer's, but she actually coordinated dances for people at this at this retirement community that were struggling and would play old timers music and learn how to dance. And she would bring in other undergraduates and teach them how to do like different dances that they could do. This was like a whole thing. And, and this is, it was not like something she showed up for two hours and did it she had this whole thing set up and like, gosh, you hear this person say this and it's like, wow, this person actually like, pardon my French, gave a hoot about doing something and 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 put themselves in really uncomfortable positions. Because I mean, talking to people that have Alzheimer's, they, it's challenging and it requires patience and all of these different things and training other undergraduates to be dancers. And, you know, I mean, she tried to take me, but I have like two left feet, so that didn't work, but um we're kind of winding down but i will answer a few more questions letters of intent eh. um to be honest with you um because quite frankly i've kind of sort of made up my mind whether i think i'm going to invite you or not so you're telling me that you're kind of interested is kind of nice but it's really not going to be much of a factor um how can i tell if somebody's exaggerating around their activities or their oh i can tell you if somebody tells me that they worked four thousand hours in one year on a particular subject let me tell you how that works. If you work a full-time job for one year at 40 hours a week, that's a little over 2,000 hours. If you tell me you worked 4,000 hours, you know, that's an exaggeration. Now, how's the other thing? 
yeah, maybe you put down that you work 2000 hours, but then you also coincidentally did 2000 hours of volunteer work and 2000 hours of research. That's about 6,000 hours a year. That means you didn't sleep for a whole year. Um, so be judicious. Don't exaggerate. We can tell if you did more than about 40 hours total of all the activities that you say that you did um, a week. Yeah, we're we're going to question that. It's it starts to raise eyebrows. So, um, yeah, we can tell. Um, and then the other thing too is like if you blatantly put that I worked so many hours, so many, hours, and then the person who writes you the letter goes, yeah, they were great during the summer project. You shot yourself in the foot. Um, so just be judicious. Don't lie, please. That's that's a that's an automatic deal breaker. Um, if you don't get accepted, can you reapply? Yes, been over that. It's not an issue. Make sure you improved your application. Don't go back packing in Europe to go find yourself. Um, ask a counselor, ask friends, ask, do some introspection as to why you think you didn't get in and then uh, work on that and then reapply. And that's, that's, that's okay. Uh, advocacy committees. Yeah, that's becoming a thing on the applications now. And that's perfectly fine. That goes under either leadership uh, or community service or so that, that we, we count that. Um, and, um, that's become a thing on the applications now. So, yep. Feel free. Uh, any, oh, wait, any advice on what the conclusion of your personal statement must include? No, every you're different than everybody else. So, um, just don't put like, and that's why I'm ready to go to med school now. Eh, um, so every, yeah, make it you. I don't care what the end of it looks like. Um, other than to say, you know, um, you know, I, I, this is why I feel, uh, and not just because of the activities, but you know, how the life experience has changed you or moved you or that kind of thing. That, that, that's what makes you more unique, you know, or are my extra skills on top of my medical experience? Um, but I'm not going to give you like a, this is the one sure fire thing because there, there is no one sure fire thing. Um, yeah. Again, with the religion, sorry, don't do it. Um, don't, don't focus on it too much. Um, I personally don't care, but a lot of people, and much like I said, the person who did abortion care, um, if you pick the wrong person to read your statement or if you pick the wrong person um, to interview you, you're going to be in hot water for no really good reason. If you want to mention one little personal statement about how that is a factor in your life, that's fine. But don't focus and make the religion the center portion of it. Because unfortunately, if you pick the wrong person that reads it, you're going to get your, is it fair? No. Are you ever going to find out that that's what turned them off? No. Um, and so I, I would just, avoid it or or I would only make a small mention of it um in in your application process if you feel compelled to write about how that's an important factor in your life but but yeah don't don't make it the center point sorry Dr. Dr. Barrios can you mention this is as uh, how many people can, how many up to how many people can read an application it's not you, you you know of course but can you just tell people so they have an idea of how large of a process this is yeah. Not so there, yeah, there's multiple steps along the way. There's um, F, if if your mathematical formula gets you in, there's a one person who's going to read your application and and your personal statement. Um, the person who is interviewing you, or the two people, the faculty and the medical student, are going to read your personal statement. They they do have access to that. In order to avoid bias, they don't get all of your application. They don't get your GPA. They don't get your MCAT. They only get your activities and your personal statement. Um, then the admissions committee, when you're sitting in the admissions committee, the person presenting the case to the committee or your application to the committee is, is going to have read it and they may pull from it. Um, so there's at least four or five people that will have, and if not more, if, if portions of it are shared with the committee are, are going to be looking at it. Um, so that answers that there was one that was in there for a while. I, we do ask, uh, and sometimes occasionally you get somebody who's like, clearly does a lot of work with physical therapists or clearly does a lot of work with, um, you know, public health and like, and, and we occasionally will say, why medicine? Why not social work? Why not physical therapy? Why not? Like we, we, we don't ask discouraging questions, 
but we find subtle ways to bring it up of, of, you know, well, why medicine? Like, and I will tell people why specifically medicine. That's one of the questions that I normally ask. Um, yeah, because social workers help people, teachers help people. Like, yeah, yeah, exactly. And so, um, you know, epidemiolo them, but... epidemiologists, physical therapists, social workers, case managers, nurses, like, nurses, you know, you know all so pharmacists. Like, it's all goes in there. So. Um, that's one of the reasons why we ask something like that. If your looks like your application is skewing in one direction, um, alumni, like if you were an undergrad at UCI, again, don't care. Uh, that's an easy one. Um, yeah, somebody put in there saying that do you prefer one school or the other? Now, on the caveat, there are some schools that are just really large and have a lot of applicants. But yeah. do you like pick what school, or do you have like a preference of? why do you guys accept a decent amount of people from outside the state? Well, that's kind of like the reverse question of like, do you only take California kids? If your application's good and your application's good, like, I don't care. Again, it's almost like I don't care where you came from. Like you could literally take that data point out of the application process. And I don't care. Um, if their applications were good, then their applications were good. Now, UCI is starting to get a reputation. So a lot of people are applying from, like the Ivy League schools or, you know, Harvard, you know. Uh, and so if those applications are good, then I'm going to accept them. Again, don't care if they're from outside or not. Like I like I said, I could almost not care where you came from. And again, and again, we actually also covered that and like, don't care if it was a community school, but it was a good community school. Don't care if you, you know, could have. Yeah, you could have grown up in Irvine and decided to go to, I don't know, University of Pennsylvania yeah, but your parents still live there, and you want to come back to California. Like that's, you know, and there's a lot of people that from, I don't know, Illinois want to go to UCI or UC Irvine. I mean, UC Irvine or UCLA. So it yeah, like exactly. Um, do you guys ever ask what specialty? Yeah, but kind of almost like in a, in a couch, it always in a like, I don't really care, but have you thought about it kind of thing? Because it just gives me some insight into what you've thought about or not. Seventy five percent of the people that say they're going to go into one thing don't go into that, so it's not really a real thing to gauge like, oh, I need more OBGYNs or, oh, I need more anesthesiologists. Like that's not a thing because like, like I said, well over half of the people change their minds anyways. I just wanted, I ask out of sure curiosity, have you thought about it or not? But again, that's the subtle, how are you as a human being person? Not what have you done to prove to me that you're ready to go to medical school question? Um, academic dishonesty mark from freshman or sophomore year. All right, you cheated on a test. Uh, did you own it? Um, or did you try to pawn it off as an excuse? And that actually applies to a lot of different things that even like nowadays too, like, and I'm not encouraging anybody, but like, you know, did you caught, did you get caught with a joint? Right. Like the point being, were you honest about it? Did you do your time? Did you not, uh, use excuses? Because if you say, well, I had this academic mark, uh, I cheated on a test, but it really wasn't cheating or it was my friend had the answers or it really wasn't my fault. And, and I, you know, and I, and I fought it. Um, eh, that's a turnoff. I would rather you just at least say, fest it, owned it, went to the core, you know, took care of it, worked my way off probation. And I learned from it that I'm never going to do that again. No, it's not going to be a big deal. Uh, ugh, committee letters. <laughs> can't stand them. Um, it's more work for me because not only do I have to go to the very blank, vague committee letter, but then I have to like find the letters that they based the committee letter on. Um, now, if your school does committee letters, your school does committee letters. There's no way around that. But my preference would be to not have to deal with the committee letter, but life is what it is. Uh, and so, um, I mean, you can't do much about that. Um, would you say UCI is different from other UC in terms of like every school is a little bit different in what they require. All I can tell you is go to that school's website and see what their requirements are. Um, and, and, and work your way from there. Like I, we're not, we haven't changed to what our requirements are in a few years and I don't really foresee any change. I know them. Yeah. You just, yeah. You just have to do your homework. Um, can you email me? Well, yes. At the, at the risk of, getting bombarded but um all i ask that you is that you really have a good serious question if you're going to do that um 
because I, I, I don't have time to repeat myself. I don't, but, but yes, if you have a good serious question, I, I will be happy to help you with that. Um, oh, what is a committee letter? That's literally where an under, uh, undergraduate will sometimes have like for a pre-med committee, like if you, if you have like a pre-med course and they will write the letter that gets presented to us on the application. But what they do is you ask your professors or, or the people that you did your community service with your your research with, or your clinical activity with for a letter. And then the letter gets submitted to the committee and then the committee distills everything and puts it into one big letter for us to look at. And it includes things like, and things are kind of changing a little bit in terms of like, well, they stood out at the top quartile of their class and they were brilliant because they did this and this and this and this aside from the, their coursework. And therefore we give a high recommendation and, and every school has different wording that they, that they do. Um, but the problem with that for me just becomes just more work. Um, because now, not only do I now have to sift through that letter and what their code language means, but then I have to go through the individual letters anyway. So to me, it doesn't add anything. And if anything, it, it detracts. Um, letters that are a year too old, a year old, maybe okay. Um, two years starts to become a problem in terms of like, unless it was even like undergrad, like if you did a first year class, like try to get the letter revamped because we actually, that just came up recently of like, dude, his letters were all three or four years old. So like, it's not like they didn't go through any effort to revamp or, or get any more fresh letters. Uh, Somebody asked you a question. How old is too old? Somebody said it's 36 too old. Uh, if you're applying, no, my, my, to date, the one person that I advocated for because they had fantastic, interesting life experience was going to be 40 when they started med school. And I didn't have any issues with that. Um, and so it, it's, it's a broad range. I mean, it's kind of like a, an outlier, but, um, if you have a good life story and, and why are you changing, you know, life paths, then you better have a good reason for it. And this person did. So, um, that's what I took into consideration, not their actual age. Um, what's a fun question. Actually, you know what? It was really fun. Um, uh, can I email you regarding your labs? I really don't have a lab, nor do I know other people's labs. I know labs is a thing, um, that, that a term that gets people that used, but I, I personally don't do any actual lab stuff and I don't call them the research that I do any kind of lab. So, um, you can ask me what kind of research I do, but, um, uh, or what you might be interested in and we can talk about that. But, but in terms of labs, uh, really that's, that's not a thing for me. Um, fat, random facts, this will be the last one, random facts that I, um, like about UCI School of Medicine is the first year back I, before COVID, we actually just this last Friday, I was one of the judges for the UCI School of Medicine uh, Medical Student Talent Show. Uh, and we had 10 acts and some of them sang, some of them danced, some of them played instruments. Um, and it was wide and, and varied. Um, and it was fun to watch them doing like fun, normal people things that where they blew off a little bit of steam and then had fun cheering each other and supporting each other and doing things that other normal people do out there in, in the world. Um, and, and, and a little bit of like, I told everybody, I was like, I was just going to be Simon Cowell, but, um, uh, I wasn't, I was not the meanest one. Um, so anyways, there you have it. I hope that was helpful for a lot of you. Um, and like I said, just if, like, I'm just really being very blunt because I mean to be very blunt where in the areas that I am, because like I said, I dislike disinformation and all these things about, um, uh, you know, I can't get in if this, or I can't get in if that, or I don't look at you if this, I don't look at, that's just, it's not real and, and be careful where you get your information. And so you're getting it straight from the horse's mouth. Um, in the areas where I was a little bit vague, it's because I have to be, I am not allowed to divulge some secrets. Um, and, 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 and in some cases there's just no actual, like this number or that number, or it's like, it goes all into the, the big giant formula that includes your activities, your academics, your personal side. Um, and, and so work with your counselors and your advisors, you're here listening to me. So that in and of itself shows that you have the intelligence to uh, go out there and ask people, which is my last advice for you guys tonight.
Well, again, thank you, Dr. Barrios, for coming for your fifth time. <laughs> I'm gonna I'm gonna jot that down now. Yes. Uh. Yeah. No. Like I said, uh, you know, you, you you know we uh you don't have to come, but you always accept our invitations, and so thank you very much. Uh. Thanks everyone for coming on a wonderful. Friday night. Um...